Welcome to part two of my introduction to the natural sciences. Part one focused on the scientific method, looking in particular at falsification and peer review. Part two is going to be focused more, to, more towards the problems of the scientific method and how those problems lead to the idea that scientific knowledge changes over time. In particular, Thomas Kuhn's theory of scientific revolutions. So, without further ado, let's get started. Just as with most things in top, there's always drawbacks and problems, and the scientific method is not immune to those. Now, these problems really deserve more time than I have in this video. I'm trying to keep these around about 10 minutes. So, if you'd like me to spend some more time on these problems, please add your comments into the notes, and I'll do my best to illustrate further. Suffice to say, I'm going to focus on the three stages. First of all, the first stage, observation. The problem of relevance, expectation and the observer effect really is about the idea that you are never completely neutral in terms of understanding the world. When you look at the world, you're always examining it or understanding it given your conceptual schema. Therefore, this in itself introduces bias at the very first stage of the scientific method. The observer effect is very interesting and has particular relevance to the human sciences. In the human sciences, the observer effect is very important uh, because it really is about the fact that human beings change their behaviour when they're being observed. Now, to uh, an extent, you could also see the same of physical things. And the classic example is really uh, quantum physics and there are some great videos on YouTube that explain this. But very basically, the idea is that when observing particles, their behavior changes from that of a particle to a wave form when they are being observed. With regard to the experimental stage, there are certain problems here as well, relating also to a conceptual schema. So you've got confirmation bias which is very basically the idea that we are more likely to look for and give credit to any evidence that supports our existing hypothesis and not evidence that refutes it. Uh, this also links to background assumptions, which are really the idea that what we think will happen really dictates the scientific methodology. So this relates to expectations and relevance in the observation stage and also confirmation biases. In terms of the law and theory element of the scientific method, we've got the problem of induction. It's worth taking a moment here to remember how talk and knowledge is really about the relationship between thinking and the world around us. If we think about the natural sciences, the natural sciences at one level is a body of knowledge and that knowledge is describing the physical world all around us. And it's worth remembering that those two things are not the same. Okay, one is the physical world and one is the knowledge. And to a degree, there is a disconnect. The hope, the ideal, is that the knowledge accurately represents the physical world. But that disconnect is really illustrated through the problem of induction. Inductive logic is less than certain, right? There is the practical problem of induction. It does not matter how many observations are made, how much experimental data supports the hypothesis, you will never achieve 100% logical certainty in the natural sciences. That does not mean that natural science claims are not true or the natural science methodology does not produce good quality knowledge. In fact, the opposite. You could argue that increasing the amount of experimental data really improves the quality of knowledge. Not only that, if the scientific knowledge claim survives, 
over time, 20 years, 50 years, 100, 200 years, uh, and you would hope survives efforts to falsify the scientific knowledge claim. That also strengthens the quality of the knowledge. Okay. However, there is always the possibility that, that a new piece of evidence will refute that scientific knowledge claim. And these are known as black swan phenomena. Uh, very quickly to explain this idea, it comes from the fact that in the 18th century, uh, Europeans thought that all swans were white, since all swans in Europe are white. Uh, and then the Europeans went to Australia and New Zealand, and they saw for the first time black swans. So that is the idea that it doesn't matter how many times you have observational data supporting a scientific knowledge claim. If new data arises that refutes that, then science must be ready to be falsified and then change the scientific claim itself. The second problem of induction is a theoretical problem. And the theoretical problem of induction really links to that law element of the scientific method. If you remember, each piece of experimental data is the particular, it is one instance that, let's say, supports the hypothesis. The law is a general rule, it is an inference. So at some level, that inference is a prediction about everything at all times in the future and in the past you could argue and in all places so that predictive element in terms of the problem of induction also means that scientific knowledge claims are best understood as less than 100 percent certain or knowledge claims that have not yet been shown false. The main point I want to get across here is that in terms of falsification, there are really two things to think about, okay? In the case of black swans, you could argue that what has changed there is the evidence. Now, with new evidence, that evidence then changes the scientific knowledge. The other thing that is going on is you could have the same observation of the same evidence, but that can be understood with a new theory. Uh, and I think that's particularly relevant to the theory of relativity, because what you're talking about is the behavior which would be understood in terms of Newtonian physics of gravity. Uh, Einstein would explain that in terms of space time, and in particular, the role of acceleration. The final point that I want to address is paradigms and really Thomas Kuhn's idea of scientific revolutions. The first point is that normal science day-to-day -day, proceeds within a particular paradigm. That paradigm includes its own conceptual schema, shared values and techniques, and shared methodology which includes what counts as good quality evidence and explanations. Over time, any theory and indeed any overarching paradigm will run into certain anomalies. Okay, so there's a great link here to Newtonian physics and a real anomaly was trying to explain the movement uh, of Mercury in its orbit. Eventually, you build up a quantity of anomalies which cannot really be resolved or ignored within that particular paradigm. As a result, the paradigm reaches a crisis point. Okay, And at that crisis, what happens is that paradigm is overturned and a new paradigm is then formulated to replace it. And the process begins again. The main point that Kuhn would argue is that different paradigms cannot be judged against one another, despite one solving the problems of the old. What does this mean? 
This means at some fundamental level, even the natural sciences are not able to escape completely the problems of subjectivity. In the sense that scientific knowledge itself is limited by the perspective, the worldview, the framework of that paradigm. Objectivists can argue that even given the qualities of Kuhn's arguments with regard to paradigms, certain paradigms can be judged maybe better than another in terms of their ability to explain, solve and even predict behaviour of physical objects. And you might even argue that there is progress in science. Just look at, for example, uh, the massive progress that is made in terms of technology at an incredibly fast pace and also in terms of medicine. If you look at life expectancy, uh, that tends to be going up. Uh, and you could argue that is a real indication that the quality of medical scientific knowledge is always improving. The thing to remember therefore, in terms of Kuhn and the idea of paradigms, is that the claim for scientific progress is always questionable if we are unable to say completely, 100% objectively, what is scientific truth, okay? So you might argue that scientific knowledge is improving, but we don't know in terms of an end destination, in terms of certainty, or maybe impossible to know that scientific knowledge will ever arrive there. So, given that last point, I just want to refer back to two ways of thinking about knowledge more generally. I've mentioned this in other videos, but it has relevance here. So the first is foundationalism, which is the idea that knowledge is a bit like a tower. As long as you can find some absolute certainties and you are then able to build on top of those certainties, by a process of logic, you are able to develop a certain body of knowledge. Another way of thinking about knowledge is that of coherentism. And I think this has clear uh, relevance to Kuhn's paradigms. Coherentism is the idea that different knowledge claims exist together in a network, and those knowledge claims support each other. So a paradigm for Kuhn represents that network, illustrated here with a fishing net. Each kind of cross of the netting represents one of those knowledge claims and that they all work to support each other within the paradigm. The problem is with coherentism is it's quite possible to claim that there is an alternative network of an alternative set of self-supporting knowledge claims that also support each other. And the problem Kuhn would say is that we are unable to judge objectively which paradigm or which network of knowledge claims is better or is the truth given that there are other possibilities. So that concludes what is really a rather brief and quick introduction to the area of knowledge which is the natural sciences. What I've really tried to do there is cover the main themes, cover the links to the key talk concepts, and also to make explicit the links between the natural sciences and some of the, the kind of more overarching themes that are uh, present in the top course more generally. If you'd like me to develop any of those points further, please add your comments uh, below and I'll try and do that. And finally, please subscribe and don't forget to smash the like button.